Thank you. It is, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today and a, and a real privilege to have been asked to be part of this uh, gathering this afternoon uh, with uh, my esteemed colleagues here on the front row. And, uh, and Based on a very fundamental worldview, foundational worldview, um, that, is, that is dualistic. It is a dichotomy. We talk about the sacred and the secular. And we make a sharp distinction between a sacred world, which is the world of religion and spirituality and God and prayer, and the secular realm, which is the realm of politics and economics and, and education and other social affairs. And we try to keep these two completely separate from one another. And this, this is where we get the concept of separation of religion and politics, or separation of church and state. And when we make this separation, then when we're dealing with, with, with issues in the material realm, the secular realm of economics and politics, we can't bring spiritual resources to that. Because spiritual resources, that's religion. That's the secular, that's the sacred realm. And we, we make this distinction and we keep those two realms separate, or at least we attempt to. This is where the word religion becomes highly problematic because a religion, as it becomes defined in the West, is something that is primarily a spiritual tradition, a spiritual practice, a set of beliefs and practices about a person's relationship to God. But religion, people like to say, has no, nothing to say to our material existence, to the realm of economics and politics. This is one of the places where I find insights from Islamic thinking so helpful. Because in my understanding, if I understand correctly, one of the basic fundamental concepts in the Islamic worldview is Tawheed, unity. Now, religion textbooks will tell you uh, that Tawheed refers to the unity of God, the oneness of God. And certainly that's true, but I don't think that's the full extent of the word. As I have it here on the slide, the unity of God, I think, implies the unity of humanity living in submission to that one God, which is where we get the idea of the Ummah, the worldwide Islamic community. But I think, think it also implies the unity and integrity of lived experience, such that a strict, sacred, secular dualism simply doesn't work within an Islamic conceptual frame. So I see Tawheed as being a, 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 a fundamentally different option from the sacred secular worldview. And I think if we thought in the West more from the perspective of Tawheed and less from the sacred secular dichotomy, um, I think we would be a lot better off. These ideas of unity, uh, I think, find expression in the writings of some Islamic scholars who have uh, written about um, economic topics. Let me just share a couple of quotes with you. Mustafa Mahmoud, uh, in an article titled Islam versus Marxism and Capitalism, makes what I find to be a really striking statement. He says, wealth is not sought for itself in Islam, but is sought as a means to piety and a way to upright, merciful, and loving action. This marks it as very different from the meaning of wealth in materialist capitalist economy and materialist socialist economy. It's that first sentence that really surprised me when I first read it. Wealth is not fought, sought for itself in Islam, but is sought as a means to piety and a way to upright, merciful, and loving action. I often like to think about um, you know, going to an economics classroom at, say, Harvard Business School or someplace like that. And standing up in that economics classroom and saying, wealth is a means to piety. I'm sure I would be laughed right out of the classroom. No. Wealth is not a means. Wealth is an end in itself. The accumulation of wealth. Capitalism. The ism means it's an ideology. The ideology of the accumulation of capital. Wealth is, is, is to be sought for itself. I lost the screen up. Here, okay. Uh, wealth is to be sought for itself. Uh, it's not a means to something greater than itself unless it's a means to power. But it certainly is not a means to piety. For a means to piety, if we say it's a means to piety, 
then it, we're, 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 we're going against that sacred secular dichotomy. We're bringing a spiritual idea into the material realm, and that's the thing that we try not to do. But I think the thing that we need to do, and that we can learn from um, Islamic scholars who do this. Um, M. Umar Chopra, in an article called The Islamic Welfare State, writes, it is the duty of the Islamic State to ensure a respectable standard of living for every individual who is unable to take care of his own needs and hence requires assistance. It is the duty of the Islamic State to ensure a respectable standard of living for every individual. That's not the ethic that runs the American economic system. Not by a long shot. But it's an ethic that we need to think about. Or back to Mustafa Mahmoud. Um, and when Islam establishes a cot, legalized state interference and set up the first institution of social security, Islam makes interference a duty so that wealth will not remain among the rich as a monopoly of one class to the exclusion of the rest of the citizens. I think this is really important, and I think this can all be boiled down to two little dictums here. Materialist economics, as we practice it in the West, promotes greed, which leads to injustice. Islamic economic thinking, from my reading, seems to promote justice as the primary value. It's when I discover this that it sent me back thinking about my own tradition as a Christian and to think about Jesus. And this is what led me to pose the question, was, as a Christian, to pose the question, was Jesus a Muslim? And I posed it and ended up writing a book about it. Was Jesus a Muslim? Um, because as I look at Jesus through the pages of the Bible, what I find is someone whose life stood against the injustices of the Roman imperial system in which he lived. Jesus wasn't just going around talking to people about their spiritual interests, but for Jesus, proclaiming the kingdom of God, the sovereignty of God, meant that God was sovereign over everything. And if God is sovereign over everything, then that has implications for our material life as well as our spiritual life. From the perspective of Tawhid than from the sacred secular dichotomy. And as a result, even though I'm a Christian, I do answer the question, was Jesus a Muslim with a yes? In a very profound sense, Jesus was more like a Muslim than a modern westernized Christian. Now, when we engage in, re in, in resistance to injustice, that resistance will itself be resisted by those who benefit from the unjust status quo. Uh, but Farid Isak, a South African uh, scholar of Islam, in his book on being a Muslim, reminds us that we need to appreciate that if we choose solidarity with the poor and the marginalized, then our option has a political character insofar as it means attacking the structure.